In uh, tribute to many of the men in our class, I've decided to play some uh, fashion from the past. And uh, these are known as the leisure suits. And there were a couple of congregations that actually banned these, I believe, and I don't blame them if you think about it. You sure wouldn't want anybody up there working a Lord's Supper with one of these on, you know, and it's frightening everybody to death. It's a blast from the past. Well, I, uh, I, I pick up my remote control over here because as any apostolic teacher needs a remote control, obviously. This does not turn me off, by the way. This simply flips the slides. So in vain do you click it at me, okay. So we're glad you're here, though, and however you're dressed. If you dress like this, that's fine. We're, we'll be glad to have you. And of course, obviously, I love this slide. I keep sticking it in every week, and that's because that's our theme, to let the Spirit work in our lives. Did you ever ask yourself this question, how do I know I'm spiritual? I mean, Paul later on in Galatians is going to say, you who are spiritual, do something. He's going to ask them to do something. Did you ever ask yourself that, how, how do I know I'm spiritual? Of course, that's answered in different ways by different people. Um, even in the New Testament, there were people who, in the Corinthian church who thought they were spiritual if they, say, spoke in tongues more than anyone else. They really felt that marked them. Colossians, we find people who doted, Paul says, on visions of angels, and that to them meant they were more spiritual, I suppose. I don't know. I didn't talk to them personally, but... You get the feeling, the way Paul writes about it, is I'm a little more spiritual than you. Now, I don't know whether that's really a game to get into or not, but Paul seems to take the tact that this is how you know you're spiritual, if you let the Spirit come into your life and work. Now, this is old medieval hymn title up here. I'm sure none of you uh, sang it back in the Middle Ages, but it's uh, Veni Creator Spiritus in Latin means Come Creator Spirit. So this is an old tradition in the church that goes way back to the first century that the Spirit is in on creation. In fact, we know from Genesis that's true. Creator Spirit. So what's the Spirit create? Does He create visions? Does He create, uh, Paul would say, uh, the Corinthians are bragging about the fact they could do more tongues than anybody else? Is that where the Spirit is? Well, Paul seems to take the tack. You know the Spirit is in you by the products the Spirit creates in your life. This is the infallible proof that you have the Holy Spirit, according to Paul. So you say, well, I, I know I am on a spiritual path if I see these qualities developing in my life. If I see love, joy, peace, endurance, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and inner mastery, now, there's no law against this. In other words, you don't have to worry how much you love. Nobody's going to give you a ticket for it. Uh, at least if they do, uh, you know, they've really got problems that we can't imagine. But we are alive because of the Spirit, so let's get in step with the Spirit, or line our lives up with the Spirit is another way to translate that, I suppose. But there's some behaviors that are never really spiritual, and that's to be recognized. Just like Jeremiah said to Baruch, you know, his secretary, do you see great things? Seek them not. <laughs> that's the American way. Don't say that. I mean, you've got to seek great things. I mean, even Hannah Banana has gone that far, you know, apparently, or whatever her name was or is. Uh, I really don't know about that. I'm sure you, you don't either, so that's good. But empty recognition by irritating envy and whether or other words, just, okay. So you say, yeah, all right. So this is how I know I'm spiritual. If I see in my life the development of the fruit of the Spirit, this unitary fruit. So that's pretty important. And boy, how fruit does make us all rejoice and feel good. You know, seeing an apple tree loaded, it's kind of an amazing thing. Just the fruit trees are really amazing when you just contemplate the idea. As a kid, I remember stealing the neighbor's pears. I repent of it now, but they were just too delicious, you know, and, and they weren't picking them. They were just going to, they fell on the ground. I, I saved them. Uh, I look at it that way, and boy, were they great, you know, and just 
like this little girl, when I look at the apple tree, I just feel good to know there's something productive going on. So when I look at Christians and I come into an assembly, I expect to be around a lot of fruit trees, so to speak. You know? I mean, well, in a good way, you know, just uh, all kinds of pears and apples, and only they're called love and joy. And that, you know, if you think about it, these are all qualities of relationships, basically, aren't they? Except for maybe intermastery, and maybe that is too. But all these things have to do with community. So what's Paul saying? He's saying when people come into a congregation, they should expect to see the development in the lives of the people there, love, joy, peace, etc. That's what we should expect. But yet you hear the stories, <laughs> horrible stories, that surely are exceptions to the rule, I hope, I trust. If you don't see love, joy, peace, etc. If you go, but you know, there, there are times when that happens. Paul says to the Corinthians in chapter 11, when you come together to assemble in the church, he says, yeah, that's the way we translate it, it's at ecclesia, in the assembly, it's for the worse and not the better. In other words, what does that mean? I always thought going to church that God somehow put a plus next to your name up in heaven. So, how could he put a minus? I mean, <laughs> well, because you go and you're not experiencing love, joy, peace, long suffering, and so forth. Okay, so, so, all right, Bob, that's cool. All right, you convinced me. Let's move on. To peace. Irene. Irene. He said that was a Greek word for peace. Now, you say, that's, oh, I get it. It's like Irene or Irenic. Is that, yeah, exactly. That's what it comes from. Irenic. Peace. Pass. Pox, all these words for peace, okay. Well, what is peace? Well, peace, uh, sometimes we think is just the absence of war. You know, everything's calm, everything's quiet, we're not being hassled. I'm at peace. Not sure that's a biblical definition. I see peace as something that has to be made. And that's why Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Because peace is just not, you know, passive. It's not just something... That, you know, there's no war going on. And I, someone recorded, I don't recall, I wish I could remember, but in all of recorded human history, all over the whole universe, as far as we've been able to determine, there have only been 140 years in where there wasn't some war somewhere. I would say warfare is the normal state of the human race, wouldn't you? And if you don't believe it, just check the news. You know, horrible things going on in Syria, horrible things going on everywhere people blowing other people up, and even doing it in the name of God Almighty, you know, blowing each other up and saying God's behind it, and we know better than that. I think peace, then, is really more something, in this sense, God gives us. Here we have a sentinel, and you notice this little passage, one I'm sure you're all familiar with, and I love the way J.B. Phillips does it. And what this is, is a, is a military term that he uses here. He says... I think King James says, don't be anxious in anything or something, or, or be careful for nothing. I love that one. Yeah, that's a great trend. Be careful for nothing, because that's me many times, you know. I, I, I'm like the guy in Rust today, you know. I don't have an ATV. I can't afford it. I'm not that stupid, but uh, I'm not that good a driver. But I can see how there's potential there to get killed real fast. But, yeah, that's not what it means. It means don't be anxious. Um, and you know what, just reading that makes me anxious. Uh, I've heard sermon, the sin of worry, and then I'll really walk out in trouble, you know, like, God, I worry about the sermon, I worry about the preacher who preached a sermon like that, I worry about worry. I it's, guess it's a little bit like being physically healed, to be healed of anxiety is an ongoing process. I don't think it just happens. I think you've got to just every day turn that anxiety over to God. Now, I may be wrong. Maybe you've got a better way to do it, and that's fine. But I see that as a gift. The peace of God is a gift. Sometimes when I can get to sleep at night, I try to meditate on the idea of peace, peace with God. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says a peace of God which transcends human understanding. In other words, it goes beyond our power to deal with it or understand it, the process, will keep a constant guard and the word keep a constant guard that Phillips translate here means to set up a sentry post. And in, in the classical Greek, 
you set up a sentry post because an army never really goes to bed at night out in the field without setting up a sentry line. And the Marine Corps, we always had a sentry line, stood guard duty many nights. And you had to know those 10 general commandments, or how many of there were, I can't even remember, or was it 12? It was 12, yeah, 10 commandments, 12. Brother, you know, you had 46 years in the Air Force, so you probably, okay, what's your first general order? All right, he used to come up to us and say that. I said, okay, okay we'll walk my post or something like that. Um, stay alert. And so you got all these orders because you're guarding the lives of all those people in the base. You know, it's really, you can, and one of the worst things you can do in the Marine Corps, and probably in the Army and the Air Force too, is go to sleep as a sentry. You just don't, that's like terrible crime. You don't want to ever do that. So God is the sentry, so you know, he's not going to, see the idea? He's not going to go, a soldier may go to sleep. Uh, even a Marine might go to sleep, certainly a sailor would, but, uh, <laughs> <coughs> sorry about that. Had to get you on that one, Larry. Um, but God doesn't, and he sets up a garrison. So I like to, you know what a, you know what a sentry does? He challenges, he challenges things, people. Halt, who goes there? You know, that, that routine. And there's an old story about uh, you know, during World War II. Uh, I don't know if anybody was in the Army or in Navy then. I commend you if you were. But there was a saying that it, on a certain island in the Pacific that they worked out this thing and, and uh, to say Lollapalooza, you know, because Japanese had a really hard time saying that. And there were all kinds of ways that you can detect the enemy. And uh, one time I heard of a... Sentry, uh, and he challenged, you know, there's a password and all that. Halt, who goes there? An American. Oh, yeah? Well, sing the second verse of the Star Spangled Banner. I don't know it. Pass, American. <laughs> <laughs> no American knows the second verse. <laughs> if you did, they'd shoot you. See? You wouldn't be an American. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say a money worry comes up, and the idea is that the God... As a sentry would say, halt, who's there? Money worry, I come to dormant this guy all night long. Bang, <laughs> God shoots the money worry down, you know. See, that's the idea of the, of the language here. Halt, who goes there? A worry about masculine adequacy. <clears throat> I mean, that seems to be very big. Everything, every TV program I'm watching now is all about Viagra. Have you noticed? It's, it's amazing how many commercials there are. That must be a serious problem in America. But... Uh, all to, well, whatever. Bang, okay. So all these worries show up and God challenges them. So I see this as a very active, needed uh, gift of the Spirit in our lives, is peace. Moving on to uh, endurance, or <laughs> that's a nice long Greek word. Now this is not all that hard to say, okay? Makrothumia, okay. Makro, a macro, what's a macro in, in computer, anybody? Sure, you know, Ronnie, it's a little program you write to do work for you, you know, to make something possible. It also means long in Greek. It means lengthy, long, makros, lengthy, like macaroni. Uh, no, it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> spaghetti, no, long spaghetti. By the way, when you go on a date, never order fried chicken or spaghetti the first date, okay. Unless you like to slurp, never mind. Anyway. Uh, Makrothumia, which we translate endurance, and sometimes they translate it patience, means long passion. Thumia, thumos, is passion, like enthusiasm. Mark, see, the problem is that most of the world suffers from short passion. In other words, they feel passion, they act, think later. And that gets you in a lot of trouble. We all know that. Who hasn't done that, right? And sometimes the trouble is far beyond uh, the worth. But makrothumia means staying passion over the long haul, so to speak. Now, you mustn't think that people who endure are marshmallows. There's, there's a rumor out that if you put up with stuff, you're kind of a pushover. It's not true. It takes the strength of the Holy Spirit to help you endure some situations, you know, without completely going berserk. And we all know that. And it doesn't mean you're a cream puff either. Does that look good? <clears throat> Passion over the long haul. And it doesn't mean you're a victim or a cream puff. You're not a victim. 
And it doesn't mean you're going to be exploited. It doesn't mean you're going to be taken advantage of. It doesn't mean you're like a pushover. That you're going to just put up with anything. But you're going to challenge. But you're not going to do it with a vengeful spirit. And you're not going... You're going to give people uh, that second mile, that third mile even, and, and you're going to endure a little. In, in fact, swift and uh, quick decisions about people can get you in a lot of trouble. I know kids, they come into class the first day, and if they don't like the teacher the first day, they drop the class. It could be a great teacher. Or as I used to say, uh, Every preacher has one good sermon in him and one bad sermon in him. And if he happens to have that bad sermon the day he comes and tries out at your church, you're going to judge everything he's going to do in his whole future life. But if he comes in and he has like one good sermon and you hire him on that basis, these are little instant decisions, you know. Oh, she's beautiful. I fall in love with her. Well, yeah, but her mother is uh, the queen of the night. You know, well, you'd have to watch Mozart to know what I'm talking about there. So you're not a victim or a cream puff if you endure. It takes a lot of strength to hang in there is what I'm trying to say. All right, moving on to kindness. Now, what in the world? Now, no, uh, this is a really good Greek word, kreistotes. Now, the thing is, this, ver this word is very similar, if you go through these first letters, to Christ. And in fact, Christ is which means the anointed one, and Christos, which means the kind word, the kind one, were often confused. And there's even a report in Tacitus about Christians, and it says there that they are the followers of one Christos, the kind one. It's a very unusual sort of uh, uh, idea. You know, if I say to you kindness, uh, how, how could you put that together? How would you define that? It's pretty tough. Go down to Ace Hardware and say, give me five pounds of kindness, please. Well, they're going to really know how to measure it out to you or what to charge. It's like love. Give me 10 pounds of love. Well, some people try to buy love, but you know that never works. Kindness. Now, sometimes these qualities are easier to understand when you look at the, at the backside, you know, at what isn't kind, okay? So, Let's see if that helps any in fleshing this out just a little bit, maybe. Now, survey says, I did a survey of thousands of people, and they asked them to describe the ten rudest things that people do. Now, some of these, I, 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 you know, they weren't that big a deal to me. So I don't know if they are to you or not, because you may have another list. I don't know. But, but look at these, and here's a lot of thousands of Americans saying, these are the ten rudest things that people do. It doesn't bother me a bit, except when my two bark their little heads off for no reason at all. I say to Mimi, why are you barking? She never gives, has never given me a straight answer yet. <laughs> she thinks she owns the neighborhood. If some neighbor dares walk across their lawn, Mimi challenges her. That doesn't bother me that much, except maybe in the middle of the night if somebody's got a dog that barks all night long. Does that bother you? If you've got a neighbor bark all night long? Does that, that, that bother you? Okay. But it's not, is it that number one on the list? It was the number one on the list. Can you believe that? Who are these people? Yeah, I can see this. Yeah, yeah, I can see this. I'm watching a great movie here. It's really fun. Guess what's happening right now? Shut up already, all right? I pay good money to watch. Does that bother you? Hmm. Now, this is really big with young people. <laughs> is it really big with young people? It doesn't bother me so much, you know, because I'm right there with them, probably. But I know it bothers me. What's your hurry? <laughs> You're just going to be there five minutes earlier so you can sit down and do nothing for five minutes or text somebody? Come on, man, give me a break. But now if you're young, I understand. You're in a hurry. You want to get somewhere. Here are these old people filling, filling up the lane. They should be banned. Um, <clears throat> that bother you? Say you go to Cracker Barrel and you're going to eat and you're in the mood to eat and you go in the restroom and somebody's been in there ahead of you and they just are a complete slob. And what do you say? 
Where were these people raised? Who raised these people? You question their, you know, their genetics, I suspect. Does that bother you much? When you have to clean up their mess? All right. What about number five? I, this doesn't bother me much. I usually say, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, I notice that people do this all the time. They start having conversations in Sam's or Walmart's or somewhere, completely black the island or oblivious of you. Does that bother any of you? Or do you, are you the ones that do it? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, yeah, I guess it, you know, I've been here 10 minutes. Like, I, I am important. Where have you been? Uh, that, that bothers us a little, I suppose. It, I don't know it's all that bad. bad. You can overcome it. This bothers me a lot. And it may be because my mom had to go to work as a waitress because she couldn't get any other job when I was a little kid. And I saw the way some people treat waiters and waitresses, and it really bothered me when I see that happening. And there's still a lot of rudeness coming out in this situation. So maybe, maybe that's right. Um, what can I say, you know? That's pretty heavy duty, you know? I can see why you'd be bothered by that. Oh, well, surely not. That wouldn't. And a kid comes over and sits in your lap at a restaurant and you've never met him before. You know, why should that bother you, right? He kicks in his shins. Uh, well, what should be on this list that's not, in your opinion? You know, I'm just interested. What, what should be on this list? What's your pet? What rude that really ticks you off? Any? Bad language in public. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, national drivers. Uh, universally, all national drivers or just a few? Are just those other than you? Uh, who knows? Anybody else? <laughs> That's a heavy duty sin, I will. Admit. That's a heavy duty sin. Uh, that's a really bad sin, yeah. Tell him what you said. Yeah, you just have to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. Humming along with Leontine Price at the opera. <laughs> Who do we know that would do that? Especially on Oh My Bambi. What is, what is that? Oh My Bio Bambino or something like that. All right. Well, I wondered then if since this is the opposite of kindness, that if I didn't do these things and thought about all these, and you notice how kindness begins to break down into a lot of little distinct actions, a lot of little, little sort of things that you might, well, that shouldn't bother him, or I don't care, that's the normal response. But if you did care, and you did try, well, I don't know. You know, I think it would help make the world be a better place in many ways. Those little things do matter, I think. Now, then I decided in my research, well, maybe the reason why some people are so rude and everything is they live in countries where people aren't happy. So I decided to look up the happiest countries. And again, I found another survey because you can find anything being surveyed today. If you want to know how many spider monkeys eat bananas upside down, you can find that on the internet. <laughs> the happiest country in the world, according to the survey, is Norway. I have no clue why. The United States is 12th on the list, by the way, I'll just go ahead, but I'm going to show you the first five. And these are supposedly the five happiest countries in the world. And we're down about number 12. And this is based on a fairly large survey taken by Forbes magazine, which is a very reputable magazine, a recent. So I don't know what that means. Does that mean if you go to Norway, they're going to treat you better than, say, they would in a, in a sad country? How many of you have been to Norway? One person, two, three. Did it treat you nice? Yeah. Do you have a problem? Yeah. They were good, huh? Okay. All right, well, that proves it, right? <laughs> Saddest countries. <laughs> no, didn't prove anything, does it? Mali, and why? Well, because they're poverty circuit and having a war going on and nobody has any money. I would have thought it might have been Haiti because if you've ever been there, you know how sad it really is there. Believe it or not, India is second on the list. It's tremendous discourtesy in India. But then that's because there's no place to go. Or I mean, there's no place to room. There's no place to drive. There's no place to live. There's no place. It's so crowded. 
Senegal, I don't know why they're unhappy there. I would have thought Somalia would have been on the list, but they were afraid to go in and take the survey. <laughs> Nepal, yeah, they kind of talk for play, but they got a lot of people climbing Mount Everest and all, so, but still. And Cambodia, and one can well understand that given their history. But has anyone ever traveled in these countries? Yes. Ah, it is amazing, isn't it, really? Oh, well, I can't, I don't know about New Zealand or Australia. But, I mean, yeah, you think of them as more secular countries, don't you? Very secular. Maybe they're measuring happiness by social satisfaction with the system. You know, your kids in Sweden, they take all your money, but your kids can go to college, you get free health care, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, maybe just feeling secure. I really don't know what the tie-in is. What? Somebody say something? I'm asking about, I don't know what the health care is like in those, those five countries. Totally secular. And you think that might, there may be, there may be, just this may be purely secular happiness. You know what I'm saying? It's not spiritual happiness at all. That's never been measured. I've never seen anybody measure that. I'd like to see that if somebody does it. How about geographically? Well, you have Scandinavia. They're pretty well represented, as well as uh, Australia and New Zealand. So there's something. And maybe they're just happy because they shot the Lord of the Rings there. I don't know. I, I don't make any. I'm just curious. Is there a tie-in? Now, we're about 12th to 14th on the list here in the United States. So we're sort of like not too bad. At least we're not down there with the saddest countries in the world. So I'm thinking our behavior sometimes then, I want to put a positive spin and say, it would be, there would have to be a certain amount of happiness generated by the spirit, I would think. Now, I know happiness is a slippery thing to analyze. Now, we do know this, right? Mean people can ruin your day. Any of you ever have a day ruined by a mean person? Nobody. Look, in the whole group, there's never, never happened. That alone is a miracle. Now we're beginning to think, okay, <laughs> yes, it can happen, if you let them, right? So some people have really ruined other people's lives big time. Does anybody know this guy? And does. Meet the original Ponzi. This is the original Ponzi. You heard of Ponzi schemes? This guy, that's his name, Ponzi. That's where they got the name. He's an Italian immigrant who came here and told people that he would make 50% uh, of, of their in earnings would be increased 50%. And the first few people he did. But then he raked in $10 million from people. $10 million, imagine. And then in the 20s, Ponzi went to jail, as you can see. All right, so this, this notice, this meanness or opposite of kindness and goodness, if you will, and I combine those a lot, is really in defrauding other people and make, you know, uh, the mean people, what I'm trying to say is if you're specializing in meanness, it hurts others. That's what I'm trying to get across. It's opposite of having the spirit is being someone who hurts other people, okay? That's what I'm trying to get across. Everybody know this guy? Help me out here. Who's this guy? It's your grandfather, right? I hope not. What's his name? How do you all know this? His name is Madoff, and what a great name for what he did. How much did he make off with? <laughs> he made off with... $50 billion. $50 billion. He almost bankrupted the great yeshiva university. The Israeli government had serious problems because they didn't invest a lot of money with this guy. Institutions of higher learning, medical institutions, people by the hundreds, by the thousands, became impoverished because of one man's greed. You say, well, if they weren't greedy, they wouldn't, you know, they believed they could get this kind of return consistently. They got a problem too. Well, maybe so. I agree with you. It's probably true. Anything too good to be true, what, is probably not true. Okay. So if you believe you're going to make 
uh, over everybody else. Maybe Madoff is waiting in the wings for you. But it's amazing how one man can hurt so many people. Now let's contrast these guys, these characters, with maybe somebody else. Now you may not agree. I, I, I know I could pick all kinds of people, but for some reason, uh, being a bit of a geek, I, I say Bill and Melinda Gates have donated millions of dollars, millions of dollars of their money to the relief of malaria among dis, um, dis, what's the word, you know, just people, disadvantaged people in Africa, basically. And Bill Gates says, in spite of the fact he is a total geek, but yet has made a lot of money in Microsoft, and a lot of people don't Microsoft, and I understand if you've had Windows, why you'd feel that way. But um, overall, you can't argue with the fact that he seems to care, and he says, everybody has a right to lead a healthy life. That's his motto. Well, I go along with that. I don't like everything about Bill and Melinda Gates, but I like that. These are kind people, and, and, and I don't know why he feels kind and why he doesn't take his money and just go live in a Swiss Alps somewhere and not worry about the rest of the world, but I'm glad there are people like that. And philanthropy, you know, has been a real blessing in many ways. Okay, goodness. Now, I see goodness and kindness as kind of melting together, if you will, and they're kind of going together. Now, this is a good Greek word, too. Agathosune, okay. Actually, agathos, good, agathos, meant in original classic Greek, brave. A good person was a brave person. So you say, a good soldier meant a brave soldier. Then it came to have more general application to someone who shared benevolence. So let's think about goodness. If I were to say to you, be good, I know you'd probably say, what in the world is that all about? Now, who's someone who evokes and purposely, there was a family portrayed on television for many, many years, and the design was to show an individual who was completely intolerant, completely unacceptable, completely bigoted in every way. You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> it is! <laughs> That was one line I really liked when he talked about his daughter. He said, she, well, uh, she got hooked up with a religious person. He said, well, I hope it's not one of those seven-day adventurers. <laughs> <laughs> Archie Bunker, and you know this is all done on purpose just to show us how ugly and, and baffling it could be that someone so bigoted and so intolerant, you know, it was a caricature, actually. And... Uh, you talk about endurance, Edith probably, Bunker, would get it, you know, in terms of really enduring. So, yeah, so that's not the kind of ideal, you know, to be that bigoted, uh, happy, pa paranoid sort of individual. And so we look at Romans 5, and we discover something about Jesus here and about goodness, if you will. Now, this is the uh, uh, common English version, CEV, which it makes a good translation here, in my opinion. Christ died for us at a time when we were helpless and sinful. No one is really willing to die for an honest person, or someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. But God showed how much he loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. In RSV, New Revised Standard does it this way, and it's a little more classically rendered here. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's a serious. So here's a real definition of goodness and kindness is that it speaks more, it speaks volumes about the person who, that they're not discriminating against the ones they don't like. They're doing it all out of love. You know, it's a really, really great model here. Okay. And so we think of people, like, I think of C.S. Lewis a lot when I think of a good person. I know he wasn't perfect, but he's really helped me in my life, and he's helped me understand God a lot better. Maybe he's helped you. Now, I could come up with hundreds. Of, you can, you're probably right now thinking of people that have done that for you, that have helped you. I'm just telling you about some people that have blessed my life, so to speak. And reading Surprised by Joy or Mere Christianity or Miracles or the Problem of Pain or particularly uh, The Great Divorce, just an incredible book on heaven. I feel I've grown and I appreciate the work he put into that. And I appreciate, now I know that he had problems, right? But he's a human. 
But he wanted to help. That's my point. He wanted to do something to help. He wanted to contribute. I, I, I'm thankful for that. I think of this man. Oh, Dr. Friedel probably knows who this guy is. Um, you know what bothered this man? This man was bothered by children being sick. Particularly, one day, living in France, he saw a child, a farm child, someone brought to him who had been bitten by a rabid dog. And he just felt so helpless to watch this child go through agony. And he determined, I will do everything in my power to come up with some kind of answer to this. You know the man's name is Louis Pasteur. <clears throat> I think of people like this who work very, very hard because they really do care. And they've contributed so much. And Pasteur, of course, did find the rabies vaccination. And as you know, uh, it was always considered 100% fatal, and still sort of is, although there's this interesting treatment now that I read about called the uh, Wisconsin Protocol, and some of you may have read about it, in which they have actually had two patients survive rabies without the shots. So maybe something coming up, who knows. This man is bothered so much, he dedicates his life. He doesn't want to see another child go through this. That, to me, is goodness. <clears throat> That's kindness. That's the spirit at work. You don't know this man, I don't think. His name is Patali Sharo, a Pawnee Indian chief. Around 1821, <clears throat> in the village of Pawnees in Kansas, some braves went out and conquered a young Comanche girl. They brought her into the village and they were going to burn her alive as a sacrifice to the morning god, the morning star god, to make the crops better. This man's a chief. He walked over to these braves, intoxicated with their own power, and he says, you're not going to burn anyone in my village. And they had a fight, and he won. Not only did he rescue the girl, he put her on a pony, gave her some provisions, and sent her back to her people. Word got out about this from some missionaries that were living in the area, and it got back east. And a famous girls' school, I don't remember the name of it, took up money and made a little medal. And on that little medal it says, the bravest of the brave. And they brought him and paid his way and a little eight-year-old girl hung this ribbon around his neck and said, you have done a good thing. And he said, I didn't know it was good when I did it, but my heart told me I should. I'd say that's a pretty good definition of good. <laughs> I like this guy, Pitali Sharo would later come to Washington as a delegation to the White House. Unfortunately, was betrayed by the White House, but that happens. Okay, who's on your list of people who do good, who are allowing the spirit to help them in their lives? You know, you think of teachers, and I've already thought of doctors and all, and Indian chiefs, so I've pretty well covered them. Just think of the impact good teachers make. Oh, you would see these kids just caught up in it. Education, reading, love. Oh, wow, I want to touch these lives like nobody else can. How about people who compose beautiful music? John Rutter. I'm sure all of you have heard his company. If you haven't, go out and listen to the 60th anniversary of the Queen of England uh, and, and then what's his name, Duke of Edinburgh's marriage. One of his compositions was sung in Westminster Abbey. It's called The Lord Bless You and Keep You. It's his arrangement of it. It is so gorgeous. Oh, you know, this makes you cry. Uh, John Rutter, I, you know, and, and, and you can add to that list. These people who have written great hymns that we sing, you know, just encouraging us. What are you, who are your candidates? I'll put some up here, okay. Uh, these people, obviously. Well, we hope they're good. <laughs> And of course, where would we be without these guys, right? Mom and dad, yeah, doing that yeoman work with the kids, huh? You gotta put them high on your list of the goods. 
How about grandparents? Yeah, you know what a grandmother is, right? A grandmother is a kind of person that if there's four pieces of pie and five people says, I don't care for any pie. That's a grandmother. Grandfather eats the pie. Okay. <laughs> You've got to be grateful for the police, friends, for the good ones. Now, there's crooks, yeah, but the good ones sacrifice their lives for very little pay. Think about it. Or just here like Labor Day, humble construction workers that work away honestly. And, of course, what would we be without cooks? <laughs> A lot thinner, I'm sure. But, uh, but all these people contributing now, who are some of your candidates that I've left out? If you got a recommendation, you're probably thinking of somebody, and you don't have to say anybody, but I'm thinking, isn't this powerful? Good people that have impacted other lives because of the power of the Spirit have made a difference, right? And I'm sure your stories would be moving and great. Yes. Preachers. Well, I would have not put them on the list particularly, but yeah, I guess... I, they can make a huge difference in the right way, I think. Yeah, all right, I like this man. Get this man a medal somewhere. Maybe we get the girls' school to strike you a medal, okay. Yeah, Larry. The common denominator in all of these, servants. Servants, oh, just that's for sure, Larry, absolutely. They're all, every, there's not one up here that isn't serving in some way, right? Yeah, that's what it's all about, okay. We could add to this list. I've covered quite a bit. I, I don't want to leave anybody. I always had that fear. I would leave somebody out, and somebody's going to come up to me later and say, oh, you, you left out the people that cut the hair on a dog, you know, and all that. Well, yeah. <laughs> and vets, and I could go on and on. But. So I say to you, veni creator spirit. Come creator spirit into our lives and create goodness and gentleness and kindness and help us to endure. You know, really, it's a tough day's work for the Holy Spirit, but he's got somewhat reluctant material to work with, but completely willing to help us all become the kind of people who bless others so they can bless others. Well, have a good Labor Day. Stay cool.